Sales development continues to grow in importance as a critical component of a successful go-to-market strategy. And with the explosion of new tools, technology, and processes, the sales development industry itself is thriving, as seen with the growth of the 10-bound sales development market map over at 10bound.com. On this podcast, we'll dive deep and go beyond sales development to think about the future of technology, processes, and tools in the industry with our host, noted futurist, author, and sales development practitioner, Justin Michael. Welcome to Beyond Sales Development. Tune in each week and be sure to hit subscribe, leave a comment, and turn on notifications to never miss an episode. And now, Beyond Beyond Sales Sales Development Development. with your host, Justin Michael. Welcome back to Beyond Sales Development. I am your intrepid host, Justin Michael, doing my best William Shatner impression. I am joined by Ryan Hiscox from moby to go VP of Sales over North America. How's your day going? Not too bad, Justin. It's uh, the evening here in Toronto. I guess you guys are on the West Coast. Yeah. How's the weather been out there? It's been super hot. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been, uh, it's been incredible because winters here are, are not so, so much fun. So even, even when it's hot, we try not to complain too much. I love it. So, um, Talk to me about selling in Canada. You know, I know there's some different regulations around castle and in a way it's cool because you kind of have to have interest to go after someone. Are you prospecting? You're prospecting all of North America. So you're a VP of sales, but in a way you're still an SDR, which is why this is an interesting persona to have on the show. And I've had this myself where I'm leading the team, but I share a quota and I'm responsible to bring in business. Uh, Do you think VPs of sales should prospect? We can start there. Yeah, you know, it, it always depends on, I guess, what situation you're in and, and how your company is structured. But, you know, for, for the companies that I work for and the size, you know, I think it's really important. You know, prospecting is really, it's really a way to stay in touch with the marketplace, to stay in touch with your customer. If you can really understand which prospects should be talking to you and risk, which prospects actually want to talk to you, you're going to have a really good understanding of, you know, which direction the product needs to move in, which direction the the AEs need to move in, which direction the machine needs to be built. It's so much more than just keeping the pipeline full. It's also the area where you do a lot of uh, marketplace testing. So, you know, if, if the VP of sales or the head of sales, whatever you want to call it, if they're not physically prospecting themselves, if, if they don't have time, they should at least be listening to calls and being very, very actively involved with the XDRs or SDRs, listening to the conversations, coaching on the front lines, because that's where you're going to really understand where the gaps are. So, yeah. Very interesting. So talk to me about how you've changed your approaches to prospecting as a team leader and sort of with the social selling revolution. Some people are taking a backlash. They're just only phones, social media. Walk me through kind of your journey. How are you evolving? Is it is there more the same <laughs> than what's changed? You know, I'm I'm just always curious your opinion and what formed it. Yeah, no, that that's um that's a good question. And there there's some fundamentals that, that really don't change throughout. What has changed, I think, is the technology and the ability to see things and to see what's happening at scale in a way. But you know, the, the same things that were that were getting prospects to buy. 20 years ago, they're the same things that that prospects buy now, right? So, you know, if your company's in growth mode or if they're or if they're even cutting costs or if they're trying to become profitable, you know, when when people leave a position and go to a new company and need to instill change within the organization, when a new person comes into that company in that position and and implements change on a wide scale, you know, th- these are all things that that will always indicate that the customer you're going after is in a position to buy and always things you want to look out for. I think what's changed though is, is technology's ability to, to read that and to send it back to sales leaders and, and sales people at a quick, at a quick pace in bulk. Right. So, I mean, you know, the obvious one is something like LinkedIn, you know, where, where, where you can actually put alerts in to, to tell you where people are moving into which direction you have technology that that's, allowing you to mine the data of what your 
top 50 prospects are doing in the marketplace when they get funding, when, when someone put, gets into a new position, when someone leaves. And, you know, in a way too, you also have to take it with a grain of salt because all that information can also lead to decision paralysis. So there, there's, also, there's also too much information. So I, I think the challenge now is to, is to really understand which technologies are going to provide you the right information, but more importantly, how are you going to teach your salespeople and yourself to, to take the information that matters and act on it quickly and efficiently? Because that's never going to change. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess all the, all the old stuff still applies, but, but the way that the information is given to us, that game has changed. What's the most exciting technology that you've either leveraged recently or you're evaluating? You know, I, I get really excited with the technology that it claims to be able to predict who is going to buy next. And, you know, th- there's different ways to do that, right? Like you could look at your CRM and say, based on the activity and the persona of these buyers in our history working with them, this person might close or, or might be likely to buy in, in three weeks time on this cycle every year. But I think what's more exciting is some of the technologies that I've been hearing about that actually will go in and, and take into consideration the news that's coming out about these businesses. It's not just taking the persona of one person within the company or the organization, but it's taking information from multiple sources and making a prediction on whether or not this company or this, this group is in a position to be buying. And it includes things like intent data, also customer personas, news and events. I, I think that's super interesting to me. And, you know, also, I, I think there's an opportunity to look at, you know, what is everyone using right now and, and what's working for a lot of people? And then looking how to stay a step ahead of that, too. That also excites me. You know, when I see a technology that everyone's using and, it, and it's working really, really well, I think that's exciting because you can look at that and say, OK, that's kind of been done before. You know, what's the next trend to hop on to, to hop kind of in the other, other direction? I think someone said it to me recently when they zig, you zag. How do you stay motivated? Like you've been in sales. How long have you been in sales? About 20 years. Yeah, I'm approaching that too. <laughs> a lot of people want to know the secret just to be motivated this week, this month. I mean, it's a grind. They're hustling. They're doing the same stuff repeatedly. What are some mindset tips or skill set tips for staying motivating? Like, you know, for me, it's like just being curious is a simple one. Start yeah. to observe, become really curious about the prospect and the time kind of flies for me. But I don't know if that solves it for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll give a couple good ones on this one. Honestly, motivation is a really, really important part of my process. And it's a really important part of how I manage my teams. You know, and it's, it's, it's always constantly changing and evolving in flux. There's certainly a few things that that always stay true and help. One thing I want to touch upon is, is focusing on your mental health, understanding how to take care of yourself holistically in the office and outside the office it's going to help you stay motivated. You know, if you can find some way to enjoy exercise, to have hobbies outside of, outside of the office, to do, be able to do positive things, to be able to even take care of your finances in, in a, with all those great commission checks you're making, be able to do those things right. And it's a lot easier to stay balanced in the office when you have a massive deal that you've been working on that, that blows out right before quotas do. You know, the, these things really help with the long-term game of staying motivated. Something you know, also that really helps is building a strong network outside of your business. For example, um, I've recently joined RevGenius and groups like Revenue Collective. And and there's a few other of them starting out, but I also have this this mastermind group that I also joined, uh, thanks to Justin, that I'm not supposed to talk about. But yeah, I find networking with other people from other areas and in other parts of the world who are doing similar things as you and going through the same struggles and and the same wins reaching, physically making an effort to reach out and talk to these people. They're out there. They want to talk. They want to connect as friends, as, as peers, as colleagues. It's super exciting to hear that somebody across the world is, is implementing the same things as you and having the same struggles, but also can give you a few new tips on how they tried something else out or, or remind you of something that you used to do that you stopped doing. You know, these peer groups are out there and, and they seem to be growing quickly. And I recommend everybody get involved as much as you can. Yeah, that's some great advice. I mean, it's really interesting the amount of like free resources that are out there. And there's also seems to be a renaissance right now for online learning and training. You know, LinkedIn 
learning or Linda was ahead of its time. But now that people are, you know, somewhat remote uh, during the crisis, there's just all these different ways to upskill and uplevel. And there seems to be time and appetite to do it in a way that I've never seen before in my career. Who do you look toward for that type of education, enablement, and training? Who do you follow? How do you stay up to speed on being a great VP of sales? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. Well, honestly, I've been following you, Justin, quite a bit recently. You know, I I know there's been some great things. I mean, you've been doing this podcast for a bit now, but you've been pumping out a lot of great content on your Patreon and on your blog. You know, you're doing things that, you know, that are a couple steps ahead of the curve and, and things that, you know, admittedly, I haven't spent enough time on. So, and you know, there's some people out there who have spent a lot of time, maybe in your area, that wouldn't get as much value as someone like me. But for me, it's all about going out there and seeing who's doing something that you didn't have time to do and reaching out to them and making them an ally and talking to them, right? You know, there's, there's some really great people who, to, who talk about all sorts of different kinds of sales. But if, if, if it's not interesting to you at the moment, then, then it, it, it doesn't really matter, right? So yeah, I, th- I think staying up to date, it's, it's not... It's not like, hey, pick up a book, read this book once and, and you're good or read a couple of sales books and you're good. Even though they all have kind of similar themes, they all kind of evolve and they all kind of shift. So yeah, keep reading, never stop reaching out to different people and networking and, and you can never really stop learning in this game, right? The second you think you have it is the second that someone else has, has gone a step ahead of you. That's so true. So one of the things I always explore is the future. What do you think sales will look like 10 years from now, will it be more similar than we think? Will it be dissimilar? Predictions abound from like phones are gone. There's holography. There's looks more like minority report. You know, uh, some of these tech companies get swooped up and bought out and turned into other things. So yeah. Where do you see that going? You know, that's a really great question. I mean, obviously, um, you know, technology is not going to stop and it's not going to stop evolving. It's going to continue into AI. It's going to continue into automation. Um, I think the, as long as humans are still the ones doing the buying, uh, we're still very much going to need salespeople to, to get these things across the line and to, and to build trust with organizations and with groups. But certainly sales in the future is going to require salespeople to have a much stronger grasp of how to use technology. I mean, even just look at the trend with revenue operations. I mean, that is a fast, fast growing part of a, a, a business. And, you know, in many companies, in some companies I've worked at, the revenue operations team is almost the team running the sales. And, you know, right, right now people are trying to figure out, you know, who's kind of in charge. Is it RevOps who controls the technology and, and implements all these, these operational things? Or is it the salespeople who are, who are closing and having the conversations? I mean, it's not one or the other. It's a combination of both. So I think the sales sales in the future is going to be very, very much reliant on salespeople's ability to manage and work with technology to better understand um, their buyers and what they actually want. Can you tell me about how you hire SDRs? Sorry. No problem. How I hire SDRs? Yeah. Walk me through your hiring process. Yeah. No problem. You know, I, I think the, the first interview you know, it's really just about getting to know the person and talking to them and seeing if there's, I don't want to use the word culture fit necessarily, but, you know, I I just want to understand if this person is, if they're excited about sales as a career, you know, the way I look for that stuff is, have they read a sales book? Have they listened to a podcast that they can talk about that they were excited about? Did they take a course? You know, I don't care if you have a college degree. I don't care if you came from finance. I don't care if you worked in a parking lot. Honestly, I really don't. But what I do care about is, you know, there, there's a million resources out there. Did you pick up anything and, and really read it and say, this is why I want to be in sales. This is why I think sales is a good career for me, right? That's someone to me who, who's potentially a, a culture fit and someone that I'm interested in working with. You know, someone, uh, one of my mentors said to me that, you know, you can, you can have a really great business and a great product, but if you don't like the people you're working with, it's going to be tough to make, the, make good decisions and make the business work. So yeah, it's, it's about getting to know the person and understanding if, if this person is as passionate about the idea of sales as I am, or, or at least headed in that direction. You know, and, and from there, it's, it's, you know, it's understanding if, if this person is, is coachable, if they can learn, 
you know, if, if they've read a sales book or if they've done a podcast and they can actually talk about something that they read and, and their opinions and thoughts on it and, and how they acted on that, you know, I really love it when someone took a technique from a book or a, or, or a video and used it to get the interview. That, that is literally my favorite situation ever. Yeah. Um, then I can tell they're excited about it and I can tell they can read information and actually act on it. So yeah, that, that's really important to me. And, and it, it is kind of hard to fully grasp that in a one hour interview, let's call it, or, or two phone screens. So if, if you see that some of those things are there, then the next step is usually some type of project or role play that can demonstrate those things. And yeah, you know, beyond that, that that's, that's enough for me for the most part. If you're getting into highly specific technical roles that require very, very specific senior level skill sets, that's a different topic. But if you're talking about, you know, SDR specifically, you know, the vertical, the industry, you know, we can train you, you can learn that pretty quickly. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty much my hiring process. Tell me what you would build. Like, I'm sure you've used a lot of tech stacks. What needs to be built? What systems need to talk to each other as a VP of sales to generate business outbound? Just maybe get into the white space of kind of, you know, from the CRMs to the pieces of prospecting technology. I feel like a lot of vendors get into building what's already out there, but what, what are your needs as a VP of sales and, and a hunter and your team's needs that maybe aren't being met? I think this is a fun question because I think we look a lot of like what the vendor landscape is and then the funding goes toward the categories that already exist. And, you know, for example, Mary Lou Tyler said, we need a follow-up engine because nothing is going to follow up for you. It's still on the human to set the calendar alerts, right? You still have to set the touches in the sequencer. So how, like, I don't know how, how you would answer this, but have you guys kind of ever just dreamed about a better mousetrap? You know what? I, I actually, I actually haven't dreamed about a ma- better ma- mousetrap. I'm going to be honest with you. And it's, it's not because I don't believe that we, we don't need one or, or one's not coming. It's because I'm of the mindset. It's like, you know, you go into a place and they've got their whole setup there or they've got some technologies they've been working with. And in most cases, unless you started it from the ground up and you've got a certain set of tools and you've got to figure out how to make those tools work to the best of your abilities. And it's, it's, it's kind of like blocked me from thinking, okay, well, what if we had this, would we be able to do better? Uh, what if this, what if this new thing was invented? Would we be able to do it? I, I kind of try to block myself from that mindset and say, okay, this is what we have to work with. And we need to figure out a way to use this to make the numbers. I, I love the way that you talk about it, MacGyvering the tech stack. You know, that, that's a really cool concept because, you know, not every company at most companies don't have the luxury of just saying, okay, we're just going to buy all this great technology and spend it all this great technology and buy the latest and greatest. It's really nice when that's possible, but yeah, I guess it's in a way it's kind of blocked me from, from doing that. Where I think I spend a lot of time though is in sales training. So, you know, maybe, you know, I, I have full confidence that the predictive analytics and the predictive data sets and, and all that stuff is coming down the mousetrap and, and I look forward to it. What I'm looking for is, is probably things like Gong are really interesting for me where they're, they're analyzing salespeople's calls and mining the data and they can tell in real time, you know, where they're making errors, where their tone is coming up, where they're, you know, not asking for the business or where they're being too aggressive. The frontier of learning is interesting. And, you know, I haven't, admittedly, I haven't spent enough time with Gong or any time recently using the product. I've been to a couple of their, their offsites, which were pretty cool, but you know, the, the future of learning technology, right? How is learning technology going to incorporate teaching salespeople how to be good salespeople, but also how to manage the technology that's going to be in front of them, right? You know, again, not to quote you too many times, but uh, technology quotient is something that that I've heard you say about a bunch of times. You know, is the new sales technology going to teach a salesperson not only how to use the the psychology and and best practices from things like spin selling and, and influence, but is it also going to teach them how to how to build a sequence, you know, how to, how to hit the sequence properly, how to manage the technology, how much is, how much is too much of personalization, things like that. So um, yeah, that, that's the stuff I've always kind of dreamed about. I really f- appreciate the thoughtful responses. Talk to me about what's made you successful over the last 20 years, like your software. How do you get to the targets you want? How do you open new business? I think just some how-to tips for the folks listening who are maybe struggling in these times, kind of what's working now. So what was working, what translates to the work now? Yeah, you know, this is a, this is a really 
important topic, near and dear to my heart. Because, you know, I, I've, read a, I've read a lot of sales books. I certainly have not read them all, but I've read a lot. And, you know, they're, they're all incredible. And I think one part that all of them, they all talk about it, but there almost needs to be an entire book on this. It's really understanding your, your customer's industry and your customer's business and, and, and their profession as a whole. You can't do too much research on your customer's business. You can't do too much research on the industry that they work in, all the things surrounding the industry that they work in, the market insights that are coming. Like if you're not buying Deloitte reports or, or, or market data reports on what the future of your customer's industry is, it's kind of difficult to provide insights because all the things they're talking about with technology is they want to know what their competitors are doing in the next year, two years, five years. They're reading those reports. They're trying to figure out from a strategic level how to play their business in the marketplace. And if your technology aligns with some of those goals, um, they're going to buy it, right? So if you can really get into their minds and get into, the, get into their heads and, and understand it, how are they being strategic over the next one to five years, you can understand how to craft your pitch and craft your product so it does align, it does match with your goals. So when you send that first email that has a few letters in it that are maybe acronyms of something that they've heard of coming down the pipeline that only people in the industry know, you know, that's going to, that's going to read that that's going to be open. That's going to be replied to a hundred times more often than, than, Hey, you know, and you know, we always talk about, you know, you have to ask really good thoughtful questions. Well, it's hard to ask really thoughtful questions when you don't understand their business. Um, so to answer your question, what, what's kept me successful is I spend a lot of time doing the research on what exactly, like if I were my customer, what are the things that I would be researching industry? And it's not exclusive to just the technology that my company sells. What is the 360 landscape? What are the things they're looking for in the market? And how do I get that information? And you know, I, I know it's, it's tough because you do have to do the things that get you the sales, which is the outreach. I am totally uh, empathetic to that. I'm also a firm believer that you need to take an hour at least every single day, specifically for education. That can be in sales books, that can be in, in, in industry information. I like to call it uh, informed marketing intelligence. IMI is what the first term that, that was taught to me when I was first cold calling. But whatever it is, right, you should take an hour of every workday. And myself personally, I find that super interesting and fascinating. Usually our customers' industries, like they're usually pretty interesting. So I catch myself, you know, listening to their podcasts, you know, listening to the, to the market reports what's happening in their industry. It, it, it's, it's genuine, genuinely fascinating on a business level, just the way any industry in any large corporation or medium or small corporation operates. So yeah, spend, spend more time really understanding that and the sales books, all that, all that psychology stuff, it'll be much easier to execute on a phone call. I love it. You've given so many good tips. What is one quote that you would share that's, really apropos for opening new business or staying motivated or any of the topics we covered on the podcast today? Oh, that's a tough one. Put me on the spot there. It could be your um, own. It could be a saying. It could be a mindset, just something that, you know, if hundreds of people hear this and it can inspire them. It could be a mantra. It could be a, <laughs> a best practice, anything you want to share. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think this is so cliche, but I'll tell you a quick story. My first inside sales job, it was a company called World Trade Group. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was a really cool, almost like a boiler room type environment. We, CRMs didn't really exist. We had paper leads. So we had to write, a, we'd write source, you know, Google or LinkedIn was new. People didn't really know about it then. And, you know, I'm not even that old. Technology is that fast. But yeah, I remember that in that company, it was my first Christmas party. And I was like one or two months into the company. And we're all at a restaurant and, and the CEO walks by and, you know, admittedly I'd had a couple drinks. So I was feeling super courageous. And I just go to the CEO. I'm like, Hey, Maria, sit beside me. And she just like, yeah, you asked, sure, I'll do it. So she walks over and brand new sales rep in the company sits beside me for the Christmas dinner. And uh, we're all talking and chatting. And, you know, I, I asked her, I'm like, I really want to kill it here. I want to be amazing. I want to be what you are. Cause she was incredible spin master. I, I want to do what you do. So what's the, what's the one piece of advice you can give to me so I can kill it? And she goes, learn to have fun on the phone. And, 
That's and the sort of the day right there. I love it. I swear. I, I, I didn't think it was good advice. I was like, okay, I was actually hoping for some technical tips here. I actually need to know how to win on the phone. But after being in the game so long, you can have fun doing it. You can enjoy when, when someone tells you off, they're just having a bad day. Laugh at it. Move on. Like it can be fun. It's fun connecting with people and people, they do want to talk to you and, and you'll have great conversations. Don't take it personally when someone's mean. Find ways to have fun. Find ways to, to network and, and to, to blow off steam with your friends. But if you can learn to have fun while you're on the phone cold calling, you are literally unstoppable in this career. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again, Ryan. Thanks for your time. And uh, we'll get you on the show again soon. Thanks, Justin. Take care.